Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Primesberger, editor of eWeek. Thank you for joining us today for this latest segment of eWeek eSpeaks. It's a series of conversations with IT thought leaders from every sector of IT. My interviewee today is Jonathan Reich. Jonathan is the CEO of Zedg, Z-E-D-G-E, very interestingly named company. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Sure. Tell me what where you got Zedge and what that means. Uh, really, there is not a specific meaning. Uh, it just has a nice ring to it. And <laughs> uh, sort of when circulating that, people said, yeah, we like this name. So we adopted it and uh, it's been with us and uh, really works well. Zedge on the edge. I can I can see it happening now. All right. Never mind. Be on the edge with Zedge. That's easy. Anyway, listen, tell me uh, what Zedge does exactly. What business problem does it solve? Uh, what's, your, what's your business all about? Sure. Um, so we've got a leading app uh, that focuses on mobile phone personalization. And uh, we're about or we're in the midst of breaking into a world of uh, entertainment with mobile apps as well. Uh, our flagship app, Zedge Wallpapers and Ringtones, has surpassed 450 million organic installs to date, really, really popular, has around 30 to 35 million monthly active users. Mm -hmm. And in essence, we're all about identity. We're a hub for self-expression used by our millions of customers uh, to decorate their phone, uh, to secure content that they can use in their social feeds, uh, as well as uh, coalesce around fandom content. Um, our app enables consumers to showcase who they are, describe what they like, amplify their personas with content that screams out to them that uh, is, is something that really resonates with them. Um, we offer both uh, free content as well as premium content. We offer a marketplace for up and coming or well-established artists or brands uh, to actually uh, sell their content to our users. That's what we're all about. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're breaking into the world of entertainment. Uh, we launched an app by the name of Shorts, Chat Stories by Zedge, that's Shorts with a Z at the end. And that's focused around offering serialized short form fiction delivered uh, either as a text chat or soon to be as uh, micro podcasts. Cool, micro podcast, very cool, I like that. Um, uh, I was thinking about Quibi, which just went out of business. They were doing like little micro videos, right? Like 10 minute things that, that, that didn't work for them. Yeah, uh, much, much different experience. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion as to why Quibi didn't work out. Um, but uh, some of the points that come to mind are clearly their production costs were um, very high, $100,000 per minute. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we're nothing near that. They yeah. also did not own their own content. And uh, we really built this with Gen Zers that understand uh, what this audience is looking for. And mm -hmm. uh, time will tell, but uh, thus far, um, we, we, we're, we're pretty happy where uh, things are with uh, our shorts product. Yeah. So you, um... Most of your business comes from the Android community, you were saying, maybe 90% of your business? Or sure. What? On our flagship app, um, approximately 90% of our users are Android users. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is really quite simple. The whole notion of mobile phone personalization, being able to add your own wallpapers, video wallpapers, notification sounds, ring ringtones, etc. It's uh, seamlessly built into the Android operating system, uh, whereas... Right. Um, it is uh, really not that easy to customize your iPhone. Yeah, and let, let's let's explore that a little bit more too. Um, it's a lot more difficult to deal with Apple on these things than it is with the Android system and Google. Um, uh, do you call it, you have called it monopolistic behavior that Apple is um, defending itself against. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. Um, so Apple is very, very focused on maintaining its uh, control of the marketplace. Yep. Uh, and 
Um, you know, we've seen in the press recently um, that a company like Epic can't just freely go out and offer its product to users. It has to go through the gatekeeper of the storefront. Yeah. Uh, and Apple has been resistant to opening up uh, our business, our vertical, uh, to the mass market. It wouldn't necessarily make uh, a lot of money off of it. Uh, mm -hmm. We're ad supported. As we both know, Apple is not, um, you know, a company that focuses on generating revenue from advertising. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've seen with iOS 14 that they are in the process of deprecating the IDFA, which would be used to provide, uh, I guess, relevant ads to users and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, so just the notion of free uh, is is something which Apple is not in love with. And we're in an interesting space because we're not super small uh, and we're not clearly bulge bracket like a Facebook or a Spotify. Uh, we're in that middle bracket mm -hmm. and uh, Apple is able to exert its control over the marketplace by limiting our ability to offer uh, a service which is clearly in demand and highly popular mm -hmm. to uh, their uh, customer base. Mm -hmm. Have you had any kind of um, communication with anybody at Apple about this, um, offering to ex uh, explain, you know, your business model and how it works and uh, why and why it wouldn't be really necessarily competing with Apple's business? Sure. So over the years, we've tried to establish a, a relationship directly with Apple. Uh, really, really complicated and difficult to do that again, unless you're that bulge bracket, uh, or unless you're generating a lot of revenue for Apple. Right, of course. So that, that's what they look at, totally, bottom line. That's correct. Bottom well, line is where it's at, you know, mm -hmm. and they're prepared to compromise where that bottom line, uh, you know, certainly makes sense for them. Just think about the fact that they're operational in China, uh, whereas Google made a firm decision, hey, we're not going to cross that divide. We don't want to be in a position where we compromise users with, uh, let's call it privacy uh, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's uh, it's you know very very savvy in terms of focusing on how do we how do we generate revenue and uh, maintain that walled garden, if you will. Yeah, and these are decisions that are made at the the highest level of the company. There's no question about it. That's their philosophy. Those are their tactics. That's how they do business, and take it or leave it. And Apple has been very successful financially. You can't really argue with that. But you can argue with the way they do business. You can disagree or whatever, and I totally understand that. And the, um, that's the way the world the world is. I have a question about uh, innovation. Uh, eWeek has always prided itself on uh, covering innovation and how it happens and where it comes from. It comes from everywhere, not necessarily from inside big companies. It could come from a, a a farmhouse somewhere, you know, somebody could come up with an idea that works, who knows, that transcends everything. Um, Apple though has, it's been debated whether Apple is really innovating anymore in their space. They haven't really had a new, very successful or even a real new product at all since the watch in 2011. What's your take on how Apple is innovating right now? They certainly are, uh, they are improving their, their existing products right now incrementally, but they haven't really come up with a new product for a long time. What's your take on that? Why do you think this is the case? Sure, Chris. So I think you said, you know, the key word, which is incremental improvement, yeah. uh, as opposed to uh, groundbreaking new uh, innovation. Um, and uh, I think that what we've seen specifically is when taking a look at their phone business, phone sales have uh, dropped, dropped pretty significantly. Uh, and Apple, we see more and more signs um, of them shifting into uh, the services business. 
think about the Play Store and uh, the 30% clip on uh, all uh, revenue that's generated from the Play Store. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to the Epic issue, that is what this is all about. In our case, uh, what we've seen is um, there may be a little bit of a crack in the door with respect to Apple's perspective about mobile phone personalization with the release of iOS 14. Um, they clearly know that there's a huge demand for this. So mm -hmm. they enabled personalized app widgets uh, and they began to publicize that uh, people can customize their app icons on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I believe that what's precipitating that is the fact that uh, you will have uh, entities that will begin selling this. Well, think about it. Every sale, that's 30 cents into uh, Apple's piggy bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I think, will continue to be a trend in terms of how they manage their business. Very good. Companies can change. I mean, look what Microsoft, how Microsoft pivoted just a few years ago with new management to move into embracing the open source community. Who would have ever thought that? Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, having covered open source and covered uh, enterprise IT for 25 years. I, that was just one of the biggest, um, you know, uh, shifts I've seen. And who knows, maybe Apple will, will um, you know, open up a little bit more as we go forward. That's entirely possible. We don't know, but we'll see what happens. Jonathan, thank you very, very much for your time today on eWeek eSpeaks. This has been um, eye-opening and educational. Chris, thanks again uh, for your time. I appreciate it. We really enjoyed having you. And for everybody following us along today on this eWeek eSpeak segment, thank you very much and have a great rest of your eWeek. Thanks for joining us on eWeek eSpeaks. Go to eWeek.com to hear more conversations with IT thought leaders. Mm -hmm.